Today, our presenter is Dr. Jenna Khododad. Uh, she has a PhD from Northwestern University in biological sciences, focusing on cellular and molecular biology. Uh, she has been teaching cell and molecular biology and neuroscience for many, many years at a medical school in the Chicago area, which, from which she's now retired. She's also served on the National Teaching Committee of the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of the United States, and has many, many other um, uh, services to the Baha'i faith, uh, Baha'i institutions, uh, you know, under her belt, as it were, over many decades of steadfast service to the Baha'i faith. She's also been in the position to speak before Amnesty International and the American Jewish Committee about the situation of the Baha'is in Iran, and specifically the denial of education uh, to them. And of course, she's been active in interfaith activities. In addition to uh, being the daughter of the Hand of the Cause of God, Zechariah Chadem, and uh, Jabiduch Chadem, who many of you remember for many years as an auxiliary board member in the mid Midwestern states, um, she's Jenna also was in the presence of Shoghi Fendi um, and uh, is able to, of course, speak about that. Uh, we may probably need to get her back sometime to talk about Shoghi Fendi. And of course, she's recently published a book. The Dynamics of Growth, Scientific Principles at Work in the Worldwide Advancement of the Baha'i Faith through George Ronald, and we'll ha probably have to get her back to speak about that as well sometime, because that sounds particularly useful, I think, to many of us in understanding the growth of the faith better. She lives outside Chicago with her husband, Menor Cherchot Adad, and uh, their children are all grown up and scattered about the country and doing some amazing services for the Baha'i Faith as well. Thank you, Rob, for that wonderful introduction and for the opportunity to speak about my father, Zikrullah Khadim, the hand of the cause. As this talk is about my father, it is bound to be replete with my personal expressions and sentiments. And this is really how Wilmette Institute wants it as well. The beloved Shoghi Effendi, in his messages in 1952 to the European Baha'i communities, informed them that Mr. Khadem would be visiting the European communities. In those messages, he referred to Mr. Khadem as itinerant hand of the cause. As this was the term conferred by Shoghi Effendi, Mr. Khadem honored and cherished it. Itinerant was befitting as he traveled extensively by all modes, at times by car, train, rickshaw, plane, and even small taxi airplanes. He traveled from village to village, town to town, city to city, and at the behest of Shoghi Effendi, country to country, continent to continent. He traveled so extensively that his passport had turned into what he called his suitcase. I would like to relate a story here. After the passing of Shoghi Effendi, Mr. Khadem's area of activity as a hand of the cause was assigned to the Western world, in the North, North America in particular, as well as South, South America and the Caribbean. Thus, in 1960, he sought an acquired visa for the United States and next applied for a driver license and was interviewed by an officer. This officer became suspicious by the bulk of his passport, bearing visas from many countries, Western and Eastern Hemisphere, Africa, Arabia, Emirates, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Kuwait, Yemen, Egypt, Israel, Japan, Europe, Africa, North America, South and Central America, and the Caribbean. So we can imagine how amazed he was. He inquired about the reason for such extensive travel. Mr. Khadem explained that he traveled in order to visit Baha'i communities. The befuddled officer was incredulous, but could not accept this explanation. He asked, what is a Baha'i? As you can well imagine, Mr. Khadem explained, the subject extended to the fulfillment of the promise of Jesus Christ, of his promised return. The officer said, 
If this is so, how come I did not see him? Mr. Hadem referred to the verse in Bible wherein Jesus has said that he would come as a thief in the night. And then he said, with a sense of humor, he said to the officer, oh my dear policeman, of all people, you are best equipped. You should have caught the thief. This humor relieved the tension. Mr. Khadem received his driver license. That luggage-like passport is now at the International Archives at the World Center. How do we remember Mr. Khadem? Mr. Khadem visited many Baha'i communities throughout the world and had very close association with some of them. Among these were United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Yemen, Kuwait, where he frequently visited, and later the United States. Some of these communities have recorded their remembrances of him. Who was Zekrullah Khadim? How do those who knew him remember him? His conduct and manners reflected humility. In meetings, he often sat unobtrusively in the back of the room, the back of the hall. He refused special treatment and never claimed distinction. He was kind and accommodating. But when it came to the issues relating to protection and the covenant, he was outspoken, forthright, and uncompromising. Though some 31 years have passed, since he departed from this physical realm, there are many who still remember him. I noted that recent postings of some of his photographs on Facebook by others roused multitude of moving tributes from those who had known him with comments on lasting effect he had on them. They referred to his staunchness in the covenant, his special connection, love, and dedication to Shoghi Effendi and his moving and inspiring talks. He was in a state of ecstasy when speaking of the revelation of Baha'u'llah and his central figures. How do I remember him? How does a daughter remember such a father? I remember him in state of rapture. From my earliest memory as a child to the last day of his earthly life. I remember that our home environment was filled with reverberations of his strong and melodic voice, chanting texts from the sacred writings of the Bab and Baha'u'llah, which he had committed to memory from his childhood and youth. He would intone them at home and also while driving through the countryside, through mountains and prairies. He would recite the poetries of mystics in expression of their quest for the love of the beloved. In essence, he was a mystic, lover of the divine, which flowed through the central figures and Shoghi Effendi. I remember him reciting poems in expression of love for the beloved. While driving through the countryside, the verses he frequently intoned bespoke of his state. Few were from a mystic poet of the 17th century, Baha al-Din Amili, who became known as Sheikh Baha'i. He adopted the name Baha'i three centuries before the advent of the Baha'i faith. Because two Shia Imams, the fifth and the sixth, had said that the greatest name of God was to be found in the first verse of the dawn prayer for Ramazan, the month of Islamic fast. The term Baha appears four times in the first verse of this prayer. I could, of course, recite this poem in Persian, but I won't because I know those in attendance may not be from familiar with Persian language, but I have attempted just to translate two verses and it doesn't do it justice. 
it goes something like that. In quest of you, O peerless one, how long should my tears flood down each eye? Wherever I go, the owner of that house is you. You are the object, you, whether it's the mosque I go to or the house of idols. And in Persian, it goes something like that for those or no, person in attendance, talkay betaman no yeto yegone, ashkam shavadas har moji chon seil ravone, har jo ke ravam sahab an khane toi to, sahab toi, masjid o bothane bahane. Such verses bespoke of my father's quest for the beloved. This love, this quest, was intensified after Zekrona came in touch with Shoghi Effendi. In him, he had found that beloved. Those who met him could feel this mystical and indescribable love. Some may have even felt that he was placing the rank of Shoghi Effendi as the highest. Not so. I need to explain that the reason for this boundless love was that in his own lifetime, my father had come in close touch with one who generated a spark in him, a powerful conduit to the revelation of Baha'u'llah. This awareness electrified him, drawing ever closer to its fountainhead, such that he was in constant state of rapture. Zekrullah Khadem was born in 1904 in Tehran, Iran, and passed away in 1986 in Chicago, Illinois. In 1952, he was appointed Hand of the Cause of God by Shobe Effendi. The family's origin was in Mozgon, a village in Kashan. You can see that on the map. Sheikh Mazgan introduced the Baha'i faith to Kashan. He first accepted the Babi faith and then the Baha'i faith. He was very much persecuted and martyred. And, you know, at that time, all in the village of Mazgan, the entire village became impassioned and became Baha'is. That's when we had entry by troops. Consequently, they were also persecuted. Among them was the grandfather of Zekrullah Khadim, Ustad Ali. Ustad Ali received tablets from Baha'u'llah. He was the father of Mirza Nasrullah, who was the father of Mr. Zekrullah Khadim. He was born, Mr. Khadim was born to a family impassioned with the love of Baha'u'llah. There was his father, Mirza Nasrullah, whose quest was to be in presence of Abdul Baha and received the name Ad Nasrullah from Baha'u'llah. And his mother, Razia Khanum, a devoted, nurturing Baha'i, and his grandmother, the courageous Bibi John. Bibi John was one of the two Baha'i women who saw their missions to go and retrieve the, mar the blessed bodies of, the, of martyrs. What they did is by throwing themselves on those blessed bodies and lamenting, this is my brother, this is my true brother. For burial they did. They had retrieved those bodies, and this was at the cost of their own lives. Mirza Nasrullah, the father of Zikrullah Khadim, served as personal attendant and companion to Abdul Baha for four years, including the period of master's sojourn in the cave of Elijah. He was the recipient of tablets from Abdul Baha. Abdul Baha bestowed the name Khadim to Nasrullah, and Khadim means servant. 
and hence our family name became Hadem. Sakra Hadem was born and nurtured in the Baha'i enclave in Tehran, known as Hayat Bak. These were houses or rooms surrounding a large garden. He lived in an idyllic environment, in a legendary home, which was a refuge for the constant flow of persecuted and traveling Baha'is. Great teachers who traveled through Iran often stayed in Tehran in this home. Among them were the poets Naim and the two brothers Nayer and Sino. It was a refuge for a small band of believers who gathered in secret to study recent messages just received from Abdul Baha. We can only imagine the ecstasy that was generated in those gatherings. As a child, I used to hear much about this home, the devotion and faith of its occupants and its illustrious visitors, to the point that I envied those who had experienced it. I used to hear stories of the two brothers, Nayar and Sina, who shared one pair of shoes, whoever woke up earlier and was ready to go out to teach, used that one share pair. In such a home was raised Zekrola Hodem. It was a gathering place infused with love and acceptance. I later realized that this was the sort of environment and associations my father wanted to reproduce in his own home. The conditions of those days were such that my father relates that as a child and youth, walking in the narrow alleys and passageways, he was subjected to curses and stones hurled at him by street urchins until he could seek refuge in the house of his destination. In a talk given in 1957, Mr. Hadem describes the conditions of those days. My father used to take my hand as we walked down the dark lanes. When we approached the house of the Baha'i we were to meet, he would bump his shoulder against the door in passing, as if by accident. We would continue walking down the lane. Meanwhile, the owner of the house would open the door slightly. When we were sure that no one was passing, we would return and quickly slip into that house. In those days, they used to bake bread in indoor pits. Sometimes the friends would meet around these. Light from candle placed inside was well concealed, so the people could not guess they were having a Baha'i meeting. From the light of that candle, they were able to read the Baha'i writings and chant the prayers. And we can imagine again the ecstasy that was generated in those meetings. Connecting to Shoghi Effendi. Mr. Khadem's connection to Shoghi Effendi, most people remember as foremost about him, the effective death on him. Sometime after the passing of Abdul Baha, the Central Spiritual Assembly of Iran advised the Baha'is to convey their loyalty to Shoghi Effendi the newly appointed guardian. Zekrullah sent a letter to Shoghi Effendi pledging his love and devotion. He received a letter back from the guardian 
and this enkindled his love and devotion. Thereafter, his most ardent wish was to attain the presence of Shobhi Effendi. They wished for that and he waited. There was a long period of waiting. After receiving the letter from the Guardian, Mr. Khadim saw Mr. Janabe Amine Elahi, the trustee of Hawabullah, and asked him, pleaded with him to write a letter to Shoghi Effendi asking permission on his behalf for pilgrimage. Mr. Amin wrote a letter saying that this is a wonderful young man who seeks permission for pilgrimage. But noting the extent of eagerness and zeal of Sekrullah, and even what he perceived was perhaps his irrationality, he added a postscript. If permission is not granted, so much the better. So my father was disheartened. He said, Haj Amin, why did you add that postscript? Zekrana secured a passport and packed his suitcase anyway and waited and waited until he could wait no longer. He decided to go to Baghdad in order to be closer to the destination. His heart's desire, still waiting. He became ill. The Central Spiritual Assembly of Iraq consulted about his case and advised him to go on to Haifa. The permission would be coming in the interim. Elated, he set out for Beirut and from there found a group of Europeans driving to Haifa. On the way, he constantly asked, are we there yet? Are we there yet? After arriving in Haifa, relieved to be rid of him, they dumped him in front of the house of Abdul Baha. Now he had the problem. He realized that he was there and he did not have the necessary permission. He knocked on the door of the house of Abdul Baha. Mirza Hadi, father of Shoghi Effendi, opened the door, greeted him with the permission in his hand, ready to go to the telegraph office and send his permission. That was the story of his first pilgrimage. This intensified further his order. And that was in 1925 at the age of 21. There were other pilgrimages, many. He went on pilgrimage in 1936, 1937, 1938, and 1940. And on this pilgrimage of 1940, two missions were given to him by Shoghi Effendi. One was to, one was to arrange for Iranian pilgrims to obtain permission to visit the Baha'i holy places in the Holy Land. And the other was a call for pioneers to encourage the Baha'is of Iran to go pioneering. And in particular, it was during World War II and there was much difficulty in obtaining visa. As was the custom, all returning pilgrims were received with a lot of love and enthusiasm by the community. And so was Mr. Khadem. Soon after, there was a pioneering fever that caught on. And this was the time also that one outstanding person who responded to the pioneering call of the Guardian at that time was Mr. Abul Ghassan Faisi, later appointed Hand of the Cause. A special mission was entrusted to Mr. Khadem, and that was 1944 centenary inauguration of bicycle. It was in relationship to this centenary. Shuri Effendi asked the National Spiritual Assembly of Iran to celebrate the centenary in the House of the Bab in Shiraz. Delegates were to come from all over Iran. Shuri Effendi asked Mr. Khadem to hand carry his message. That magnificent 
70 page centenary tablet to hand carry that. Now this was not easy. This was not easy. Because transportation was not available and first of all the centenary tablet had not arrived in, in Tehran. It was already been through Iraq but had not arrived in Tehran. One remarkable devoted Baha'i by the name of Colonel Nizam Nafis, who was a pilot and had a very important position in the Air Force, took charge of flying to Iraq himself and flying back with the message to Tehran. Now Mr. Khadem had to get the message to Shiraz in time as it was his mandate from Shoghi Effendi and it had to be done. Flights were not available, transportation was not available, so he set out in his own car to drive the great distance from Tehran to Shiraz on unpaved roads, a distance of 550 miles. Before he set out, he knew he needed new tires. None was available. It was during the war. A devoted Baha'i offered to remove the new tires from his own car and place them on his. So Mr. Khadem managed to reach Shiraz just in time as the convention was convening. Partial account of this is to be found in Baha'i World, Volume 10. Appointment at Hand of the Cause. On the morning of February 28, a cablegram arrived in our home from Shoghi Effendi. Mr. Khadem was the recipient of all cables from Shoghi Effendi addressed to any person or institution in Iran. He called himself the mailman of Shoghi Effendi and took much pride in that. As was his custom, he prepared himself with prayers, with ablutions, and with reference, open the envelope. It read, Zekrullah Khadem Tehran, moved to convey glad tidings, your elevation rank hand cause. Appointment officially announced. Public message, address all national assemblies. May sacred functions enable you enrich record services already rendered faith. Baha'u'llah. He was in state of disbelief. My mother found him stunned and tearful. He could not believe the veracity of this message. He felt unworthy. He said, I know it's the covenant breakers who are the source of this message. He set out to prove his thesis. But when it was confirmed that the telegram was indeed from Shoghi Effendi, Zikrullah prayed humbly thereafter, day and night, to become worthy. He meditated on the obligations of the hands of the cause, given by Abdul Baha, to diffuse the divine fragrance to edify the souls of men, to promote learning, to improve the character of all men, and at all conditions become sanctified and detached from earthly things. He exerted his activities on the duties given by Abdul Baha, the hands of the cause, the two duties of protection of the unity of the faith, and propagation. Impassioned after his appointment as hand of the cause, as unworthy as he felt he was, he asked permission for another pilgrimage, his sixth pilgrimage in 1952. Two weeks before departure, he was entrusted by Shoghi Effendi to carry the original copy 
of Kitab Iqan, the book of certitude, and carry that to him. It had been his wish, unexpressed, that he would be assigned with this blessed duty of carrying the original copy of Kitab Iqan, Book of Certitude. You will all recall that it was a copy that was written on that very night in the course of 48 hours. It's in the handwriting of Abdul Baha, with notations in the handwriting of Baha'u'llah in the margins. There is a beautiful story associated with that. Time permitted at the very end, if you ask me, I can elaborate further on this sacred duty of my father. After this, his appointment as hand of the course, then the scope of his activities took on international scope. In 1952, Shoghi Effendi asked Mr. Khadem to visit the Baha'is in the 10 European Gold countries, the objectives of the second seven-year plan. And in a cable, I have already mentioned that to European Baha'is, he referred to him as itinerant hand of the cause. Mr. Khadem recalled that in 1937, on one of his pilgrimages, Shoghi Effendi had told him, I will send you to the West to witness with your own eyes the secret, the mystery, the light of the cause of those lands. He traveled extensively to those whole countries. Indeed, he did behold the light of the faith in those regions. This caused him to often use the expression, O oh God, increase my astonishment in thee. Many remember him for this statement which he repeatedly made, O oh God, increase my astonishment indeed, indeed. Shobhi Effendi asked Mr. Khadem to prepare for similar visits to Africa and to attend the Kampala conference. As bidden by Shobhi Effendi, Mr. Khadem set out for Africa on December of 1952 to communicate the Guardian's love and appreciation to virtually every Baha'i in Africa. He went to the Intercontinental Teaching Conference in Kampala, Uganda, as bidden by Shoghi Effendi, and then he continued his travel to Nairobi, Kenya, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Zambia, South Africa, Belgium, Congo, Angola, Morovia, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Morocco, to convey the guardian's love to every single Baha'i in Africa. He assiduously visited every single Baha'i at the behest of Shoghi Effendi to convey the love of the guardian. It was difficult to find those individuals, to find directions, and to reach faraway places. At times, he had to hire a pilot and a taxi plane under very unsafe conditions. The dedication of the Baha'i House of Worship in Wilmet, due to instruction of Shoghi Effendi, the program which had already been published was revised. Mr. Khader was to chant a selection from the writings of the Bab. The text of the selection was handwritten by Shoghi Effendi. Sixteen years earlier, in 1937, Shoghi Effendi had told Mr. Khadem that he would chant at the dedication of Baha'i House of Worship in Wilnet and that Mrs. Khadem would accompany him. And on this pilgrimage, he handed Shoghi Effendi handed him a handwritten passage from the writings of the Bab and asked him to chant it. He did. And after the chant was over, my father takes this piece of paper with handwriting of Shoghi Effendi, tries to put it in his pocket. But Shoghi Effendi stretches his hand and takes that from him. 
So he was not able to have that peace. Now, at this meeting, 16 years after, at the dedication of Baha'i House of Worship, Shoghi Effendi asks him, he writes into the program that he should chant that selection, and the text was that handwritten piece by Shoghi Effendi. Extensive travels in India. At the behest of Shoghi Effendi, in 1952, and 1954, Mr. Khadim traveled through India. On behalf of Persian hands, he consulted with National Spiritual Assembly of India, Pakistan, and Burma in order to take action for purchase of land for the house of worship. And we know this was the objective of the 10 year plan. He visited the temple site in Bahapur with members of Indian National Spiritual Assembly for the dedication of the temple site and received a cable from Shoghi Effendi. Deeply appreciate services, urge friends, concentrate, objectives, plans, assure, loving prayers. Japan and onward. As the Guardian's representative, Mr. Khadem attended Asia Teaching Conference in Nikko, Japan in September of 1955. This was aimed at increasing the number of local spiritual assemblies to provide the foundation for formation of the National Spiritual Assembly of Northeast Asia. By 19, 1957, this NSA was elected. After Nikko, he continued his tour of Japan, visiting Hiroshima, on to Macau, Hong Kong, Thailand, Burma, Singapore, Philippines, and Vietnam. He arrived in Langur, Rangoon on November 22, 1955. Traveled by rickshaw to the village of Daydana, significant village because that was the place where Sayyid Mustafa Rumi lived. He had brought the Baha'i faith to this village and was murdered during World War II. He had translated the writings into Burmese and helped transfer. Listen, he helped transfer the marble sarcophagus for the sacred remains of the Bab to Haifa. Posthumously, Sayyid Mustafa Rumi was designated Hand of the Cause by Shoghi Effendi. The passing of Shoghi Effendi on November 4, 1957. I need not express the sorrow Mr. Hadem felt over this. It continued for some time. In fact, the entire Baha'i world was in mourning, especially my father because of his special connection to Shoghi Effendi. He grieved intensely. And then one night, one morning he woke up and he was a different person. He said, last night, I dreamt of Shoghi Effendi. And he told me, take off your black overcoat. He saw that as a message that he should stop grieving. Thereafter, he was a different person. He's dedicated the rest of his life to service, first to the hands and then to the universal house of justice. Later services after the passing of Shoghi Effendi. Together with other hands, it was the completion of the 10 year crusade. You will recall that we were barely past the half point of the crusade when we lost, lost its general, its commander, the beloved Shoghi Effendi. So the hands were took care of the completion of the 10 year crusade 
and the election of the Universal House of Justice in 1963. On November 25, 1957, the 26 hands of the cause assembled in the Holy Land and unanimously adopted resolution to constitute a body of nine hands, the custodians, to serve the interests of the faith in the world center. Other hands were assigned to other parts of the world. In 1959, Mr. Khadia was assigned for protection and propagation in North, Central, and South America, and the administration of auxiliary board members. <coughs> Mr. Khadem moved to the United States in 1960. In June of 1972, while Mr. Khadem was in Holy Land, the Universal House of Justice asked him to undertake the task of researching all of the places associated with the lives of the central figures. Mr. Khadem began work on this project, the Registry of Baha'i Holy Places. He read all out-of-print books, manuscripts, and accounts in several languages and their translations and corresponded extensively I remember those wonderful years when he was dedicated to the registry of Baha'i holy places with so much enthusiasm and excitement. He completed the work in five years and sent 134 volumes to the Holy Land and received this message from the Universal House of Justice on behalf of the Baha'i historians of the future, as well as the Andar Baha'i community, deepest gratitude for the meticulous research and thorough investigation you have made of historic sites hollowed by the sacred associations of the past. These are simply some of those volumes, a number of volumes on Iran, Iraq, some of the 134 volumes. And of course, there were those in Europe, Europe, United States, in Turkey, and so on, 134 volumes registry of Baha'i holy places. The bounty of Hohullah. Mr. Khadem had a firm belief that the spiritual and material are intimately connected. In 1984, the National Spiritual Assembly of the United States, Baha'is of the United States, asked Mr. Khadem to address the 75th National Convention. He was moved and to remind the convention of a scroll of names sent to Abdul Baha in 1907 by American believers, petitioning him for permission to build the Mother Temple of the West, using that as a precedence, as the example, he asked that a petition be sent asking the Universal House of Justice to consider permitting the Western believers to have the blessings of the law of Hukubullah. Here is Mr. Khadem in that session, 1984, at the 75th National Convention. Those who were present will remember that it was a long stretch of roll, and many, many feet long, and those in the convention who wished and most did put their signature on that roll, on that two more. And this was a response from the Universal House of Justice. Last April, we were deeply touched by receiving a petition from the delegates gathered at the National Convention of the Baha'is of the United States, requesting that the law of Hova law be made binding on all believers in the country. Although it is not yet the time to take this far-reaching step, we are moved to decide that as a preliminary measure, the text 
relating to Allah will be translated into English for general information against the time when this law will be applied more widely. And it is now applied more widely. Mr. Khadem has written several books and articles. I choose to briefly talk about one of his articles, Pilgrimage to the Scenes of the Bob's Captivity and Martyrdom. This writing imparts the passion of the Bob. It is moving and descriptive of the terrain and the sites associated with his captivity and martyrdom. On the ninth day of July 1950, for the commemoration of the centenary of the martyrdom of the Bab, the members of the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of Persia set out for a nine-day pilgrimage to Azerbaijan, to the sites of the Bab's captivity and martyrdom. It was a long distance from Tehran to Azerbaijan. They traveled to Urumiye and Tabriz, and then toward Khoi. They wished to walk to the mountain of Maku, just as Mullah Hussein had done a century ago. The account of this is found in Baha'i World Volume 12. The description of the plains and mountains are expressive. Some excerpts over a wide area around Maku, the plains are black. The world mourns at Maku. For mile on mile, the land is studded with outcroppings of glistening black rock. All nature is a prison here. It was on this trip to Moku that, as bidden by Shoghi Effendi, Mr. Khadem obtained a piece of the plaster from the fortress of Moku, which was later placed under the golden tile of the dome of the shrine of the Bab. This moving and poetic act of Shoghi Effendi brings into sharp contrast the forlornness of Moku, where the Bab was imprisoned without a single candle and now the light surrounding his shrine, in the words of Shoghi Effendi, terraces of light, light upon light. How do I remember him? Foremost, I remember him for his unshakable faith, for infusing our home environment ever since I remember with the love of the central figures with ecstasy, ardor, and passion. I remember the celebration of holidays. I remember especially the period of fast in our home. As children, we did not observe the fast, but could rise early and partake of the experience, a prelude to fast with all of us seated in state of attention and reverence, my father would start to chant the prayer for the fast in his melodious voice. We would collectively join him in chanting the refrain. Thou seest me, O my God, holding to thy name, the most holy, the most luminous, the most mighty, the most great, the most exalted, the most glorious. And clinging to the hem of the robe to which have clung all in this world and in the world to come. And so on the refrain got repeated in this manner throughout this magnificent prayer. Many years later, when in college, dormitory, 
I would wake up during the fast at dawn with a, left, with a leftover sandwich from the night before, but refreshed with the memory of that fast and that chant, and also to this very day. I remember him as a caring and devoted father. Though he had many responsibilities, his commitment to his family was strong throughout his life. My mother had a big part in this. For his marriage was to Javidor, Javid Hadem, the woman he loved, honored, and respected throughout life. She was his supporter and collaborator. She relates that on the night of their wedding, he told her, he told her, I have no expectations of you for housework, for cooking, for any of that. I have hard people for that. There's only one expectation, that you love and be devoted to Shori Fendi as I am, and to its central figures. She said, I will try. And she did. This is now Mother's Day. And I want to express my appreciation to her. How do I remember him? He was named Zekrala, which means mention of God. So well characterized him until the end of his life, that mention was on his lips. He had vast memorizations. He recited until his last breath. The holy verses from the hidden words flowed incessantly, incessantly from his lips. I was in the room with him among his last recitations of Baha'i Holy Scriptures were, O oh, befriended stranger, the candle of thine heart is lighted by the hand of my power, quench it not with the contrary winds of self and passion. The healer of all thine ills is remembrance of me. Forget it not. Make my love thy treasure and cherish it, even as thy very sight and life. I want to thank Rob Stockman and Boyd Zadiski I hope I've pronounced that correctly, Stasvitsky. And I want to thank all those in attendance who have participated in this webinar session and those who would be listening to it at some future time. I want to thank my dear brother, Rami, Dr. Rami Khadem, who has shared some of the images from one of his videos, Zekrola Khadem, Hand of the Cause. This is one of the four magnificent and moving volumes on Hands of the Cause, starting from the time of Baha'u'llah. I can share with you, as Rob had requested, several pictures, precious pictures, which you may enjoy seeing. Stavido and Zekrolahatem in later years as supporter and collaborator of my father. Zekrullah Khadem's early days in the United States, his later days in the United States. And a picture of Salim Nunu, who was like unto a brother to Zekrullah Khadem. Salim Nunu, Zekrullah Khadem, with hand of the cause, Keith Ransom Keller. And here is a precious, precious image, although the resolution is not that great. Nevertheless, hand of the cause, Zekrullah Khadem, with hand of the cause, William Sears. Thank you all very much. Jenna, thank you.
so much. I'm so that I became so emotional. I had I was pinching myself to prevent myself from becoming emotional, and yet it did happen. I apologize. These are tears of joy. I feel them too. I I've been rubbing my eyes and and thinking so much of of this marvelous life and and the inspiration you felt and the inspiration that you can share with the rest of us and with the Baha'i world. And this is a precious gift to everyone. And I have to thank you from the bottom of my heart for this incredibly beautiful and moving and inspiring uh, discovery of of his life and for you i'm sure a rediscovery and a reminder and a a reminiscence and and uh i'm sort of without words myself for this really marvelous marvelous presentation and i can't thank you enough for it really uh we do have some questions and i have to go find them now because <laughs> because i was so busy thinking about all of this um of course, one person is immediately asked to tell us more about the the Igan, the Kitabi Igan, and the the bringing of the that Kitabi Igan, I suppose, from Shiraz to to Haifa. Is that yes, where? yes, yes? So you would like to hear about that, please? Well, this is what I understand based on my reading and research. I hope I'm totally accurate. Uh, the essential parts are accurate. That, uh, that Fatima Khanume um, Afnan, one of the relatives of the Bab, found the Book of Iran in her home. She related that she had found this original <coughs> Book of Iran to Mr. Hand of the Cause, Mr. Samandari. Mm -hmm. Mr. Samandari, now I have to tell you that <laughs> some of the details. The essential information is accurate, but some of the details may be, may be not that exact, but that he, she informed Mr. Samandari, and Mr. Samandari informed Shori Effendi, and Shori Effendi, and so he asked, uh, Mr. Samandari asked Fatima Khanum Afnan to submit the book for the World Center. She was attached to it, and she didn't want to submit it. And Shori Effendi said, don't, don't insist, don't bother. But later she became ready and she conveyed that she wants to submit the book. So the book was kept in a vault for a while. My father knew about this book and his, in his heart he had wished that someday when this is to be taken to the World Center, he would be the one who would carry it to the World Center. And so that's how it happened. So that precious book of Iran which you see in the archives has this story behind it, that priceless, priceless uh, book of Iran. And on the way while carrying this in the airplane, uh, my brother Mujan has also accompanied my father. He says that throughout the entire flight from Tehran to Haifa, my father was reciting passages from the book of Iran. He had memorized Essentially, all of Iran, I understand, to memory. As a child, he was said that his father would give him prize every time he would come up with a memorization. And so, Shoghi Effendi also asked him to memorize. So when he got back from his pilgrimage, his memorizations in increased. But the passages of Iran, he had memorized. So on the way on this flight, I don't know how many hours it took, he was reciting the book of Iran on the plane. And so in tearful state, he reached Haifa and he was able to submit that to Shori Effendi, that priceless gift. And you said it was in the handwriting of Abu Baha. Yeah. Yes, it was. Comments, comments by Baha'u'llah in the margins? Yes, that's what I understand. I, I, I hope, now that I've said that, I, need to, I always need to check my facts twice or three times or four times. I hope I'm, I'm correct in that, yes. How, how amazing. In the course of 48 hours, it was revealed to yes. the uncle of the Bob, who was looking for proofs 
that that his nephew was the promised one, as you all well know. And of course, the letter that the nephew of the uncle, because he was in, he was there receiving it. That letter we now have translated into English as well, and we even know the date was January and and everything when this all happened. But of one or sixty-two, I can't remember. So we have so much we now know about this book, and thank you so much for this really marvelous additional insight uh, about it. What what you, you uh, what did your father do for a living? Oh, well, in the beginning he was a developer of lands and buildings. He did very well. He became very prosperous. Then he sought because the guardian had asked him, loved guardian, to for for to arrange for Baha'is to to come to holy places. Uh, he sought a position. Uh, in uh, the uh, in a consulate in the consulate of uh, Iraq mm -hmm. and there he was able to help the Baha'is to obtain visas then after that he left when he left his position he devoted all his time to the Baha'i faith fortunately he was prosperous enough he didn't have to worry about earning a living <laughs> oh, really when did your father learn English I would think that he must have been inspired by the fact that the Guardian wrote in English to want to learn it as well because of the fact that there are some things not available in Persian and Arabic that the Guardian was writing. Yes, he, he is self-taught and then he he went to Darul Funun. He studied formally as well as concentrated on that himself and self-taught English. His English was quite good. Yes. But we all speak it. <laughs> I remember how beautiful his English was, how incredibly moving his his talks were. And I was at the convention there in uh, 1980. What year did you say it was? 84. Yes. I signed I signed that petition. <laughs> yes. I, I was the delegate, but they let the guests sign it as well. I remember that so well. I remember that so well. Well, Nancy Warren has a comment here. What a treasure you've given to all of us. Thank you for creating this personal, emotional, and remarkable record of a great man as we listen. We Baha'is owe a debt of appreciation to those such as you with such firsthand experience who take the time to capture the lives of believers so prominent in the history of the faith. Sending love and gratitude your way in exchange for the enormous joy you have brought to us today. Nancy Warren in Scotland. That's a beautiful expression. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Nancy. And it shows you how far this can travel. It's really quite amazing. <laughs> Herjaya also thanks you. She says, Thank you so much for this elaboration and for your entire discussion. Dr. Hododad, thank you, Robert and Wilman Institute, for this precious talk. And Annette Moody says, thank you so much for this blessing. You have brought tears to my eyes. What a wonderful gift you have being his daughter. Annette. Thank you, thank you. I ask for your prayers again, to be worthy of being in this magnificent Baha'i faith and to know about the revelation of Baha'u'llah. How has his life inspired your life, if I may ask? <laughs> well, I feel shortcoming all the time. So that's what I can tell you. I think how in the moments uh, what I discussed in this presentation of his personal life, how the Baha'i faith came first in his life, in everything he did. So that is that remains an inspiration for myself and my siblings. And the level of devotion which he had to our faith, to the Baha'i faith, and the depth of his understanding of the writings of the Bab and Baha'u'llah. Of course, 
none of us can reach, can fathom these writings, but even to the extent that he did. And his steadfastness and his courage in defending the Baha'i faith. Stephen Beddingfield, who I believe is up in Yellowknife, so Scotland is not necessarily the only distant participant today. Uh, Stephen says, years ago, I heard an audio tape of your dear father recounting his experiences in the Arabian Peninsula. He really expressed his love of that place. It was very moving. Can you comment on his services or love for that land? Yes, for some, for some reason, he was especially uh, attached. He loved the Arabian, uh, the Baha'is who were in those regions, in the Arabian Peninsula itself, and in uh, Kuwait, in the Emirates, in uh, Yemen. And uh, he was very close to the Baha'is there. Somehow, they could really understand him, the depth of his feeling and his sentiments. He traveled frequently there. So I think it probably relates to, to that, his, uh, his relationship to that part of the world. After all, you know, we all have various sentiments, which are, uh, depends very much on our background. And he found that in those regions of the world. Not that he did, he also found that in, in the United States, in North America, South America, wherever he went, but the expression of it, I mean, Seems to me, I once heard him tell a story, maybe at convention, about a mullah or a sheikh uh, on radio or TV in Saudi Arabia talking about this place called Abha in the Hejaz and praising the qualities of this place. And at the end, the sheikh says, Allahu Abha, or something. And your father was saying, see, even the, even the, even the clerics in Saudi Arabia praise um praise the, <laughs> praise the give the greatest name uh i seem to remember that turning to the um uh i turned to my other computer here turning to the facebook page because people were watching you live there as well um sue emil uh asks again she thanks you for in advance for presenting these precious reminiscences the beloved hand of the cause zekrola hadam and um, she asks this question, uh, which I think the answer she can't, but anyway, the question is, where might, might we access the 70-page centenary tablet of Shoghi Effendi Lohadarn, which I think no. is not available in English, is it? I don't know. I don't know. If, in, in English, for the Western world, it was God Passes By, yes. was centenary. But for, for, the, for Iran, it was... Yes, I have. I don't know. I don't know whether it's been translated into English. It's a yeah. masterpiece. I have it. I heard it's a beautiful piece of Persian literature, and it's a kind of summary of God passes by in a way. But uh, perhaps someday we'll have it in English. So, I guess Sue's answer is she has to learn Persian. To or maybe maybe somebody is translating it or. That you and I may not be aware, and yeah. but I know who to, I know who to ask. <laughs> I will. And Lise Lise Gagnon says, "Thank you, Jenna. I remember you and your family with the greatest of love." <laughs> I hope I've pronounced her name correctly. Uh, I know Lise. She is, she is precious, precious. She was part of our lives for a short period that will never be forgotten. Lise Gagnon. My love to Liz. Good. And Giti Kiani says, um, "What does she say here? When will the rest? Of, when will the rest of the talk and the photos appear?" I think she may be referring to when we'll be putting it up on the website. And of course, we'll have it up on the website within 24 hours if people want to see it. Um, could we possibly have the transcript also that you were reading from? That we could put that up. You want? Maybe you want to edit it a little bit, but. Well, actually, what the transcript is, is, is essentially the text of the that power. was on. But That's if you true. want anything in addition to that, and if you request it, I can think about that. Okay. okay. The PowerPoint. I, did, I used the PowerPoint because I thought it would be very clear, and it would be conveyed without uh, with any confusion. 
So I hope it was a mode that was effective. Oh, yes. I can remember 10 years ago you telling me you must start using PowerPoints. <laughs> and I did. And I did. Uh, and, and you're clearly the master of the PowerPoint. And uh, I much appreciate your meticulous care in creating these PowerPoints. They really are very, very thorough that way. Paul, Paul Mantle says, um, uh, what's this? He, he told of being asked, your father, I guess, told of being asked at a border, are you a salesman? And he said, the answer is yes. What do you sell? Instant spiritual love. <laughs> uh, I don't know, I've never heard that story. But... Uh, I hadn't either. Well, that's a good story. It's a good story. Uh, let's see. And he says, thank you for that. Um, let me see if we have any other questions over here. Merat uh, Bagot, Bagot from Switzerland says, thank you and greetings from Switzerland. Um, Ravaye Sadguru says, I remember with love the temple. So I suppose she will add some prayers as well from perhaps the Indian temple. I'm not sure which temple she's referring to. Um, and I'm looking to see other questions and see what else we might have here. Uh, I think that's just about it. I had another question too. Oh, I had a question for you. The cable that he received, um, appointing him a hand of the cause, you read it in English. Did he receive it in English or in Persian? In English, always in English. Really? These cables were always in English, yes. To Tehran, how interesting. Tehran, yes. And so his English was quite good, obviously, at that point. Oh, yeah. yes. His English, as far back as I can remember, was quite good. Huh. So he started studying English early on, yes. The early days of the guardianship. That's quite remarkable. That's quite remarkable. Oh, let me see. Any closing story or reminiscence that you'd like to share with us? Well, <laughs> one of them, my husband said, you know, if you can, if you, if there is time, why don't you tell them about your first pilgrimage when I was a child? And please don't ask me what date that was. <laughs> I was alive. Huh? What's happening? two years old, okay? So we went to the presence of the beloved guardian and my brother who's two years older than I, he and I accompanied our parents. And uh, so in presence of the guardian, uh, I was, you know, in that hall, I don't know whether you remember, as we entered the house of Abdul Baha, to the, to the left, there is a hall where uh, Shoghi Effendi used to receive the pilgrims. So, we went into that room and I sat across from him in the divan, across from where he was sitting. He was sitting in a chair, in an armchair, right across from entrance. And I was across from him on that divan. And as was the custom of at that time, this posture was the posture of reverence. Yes. So they say, they tell me that you were sitting like that in that posture and you were bowing and you were bowing and suddenly you lost your balance and then went right in front of his feet. <laughs> of course, my mother was very embarrassed. So when they told me that's what I did in later years, I realized what I had done. I told her, look, don't be embarrassed. That was my first act of reverence to Shobhi <laughs> And what my brother did, what my brother did, I hope he doesn't mind my saying this, he was asked to, to say a prayer, you know, by children memorize prayers. And so he started in Persian with this prayer, it's translated in English, the, in Persian it says, as pistone enayat shirde, from the breast of providence, give me milk to drink. And because he hated milk so much, he said, as pistone enayat, from the breast of providence, don't give me milk, but give me, <laughs> give me a big cookie. Oh. 
<laughs> so because he had asked for a cookie, they got him a cookie. So oh. these are, I don't know whether <laughs> these do not add very much, but the humor. But my second pilgrimage, of course, was very different from the first pilgrimage. And that was absolutely remarkable. It was, I was fortunate to have a second pilgrimage. I went as a junior youth with my grandmother, Razi Hanu. And uh, that was what really, truly, truly had the greatest impact on my life. But that's another story. Well, perhaps we can have you back sometime. <laughs> and certainly we would like to have you back to talk about your book. So perhaps we can arrange that at some point in the fall or something. Because we don't want to wait until the book is no longer hot. We need to, we need to talk about it while, while it's still easily available. And, and, uh, and it sounds like it'll be of great interest and a great contribution to our discussion about how the faith grows in this very important five-year plan when we're really devoted to an effort to establish the faith widely and deeply in many, many clusters around the world. So, yes, I think that is so important because from childhood, I remember having this nagging thought, when will we grow? When will we grow? When will this faith be known? Because I would come home and in the home environment, it was a whole different world. Then I would go to school, either to the Presbyterian Missionary School, which was a wonderful school, but it was a whole different story. And then to the Muslim surrounding, it was a different story. So as a child, I knew this was the answer. So I would be asking these questions. When are we going to grow? We are not growing fast enough. And so that translated itself over the years, ultimately into this book, which uh, I hope Good. those who find it of value. Good, excellent. Well, thank you again very, very much for this precious um, view, this precious little um, insight into your father's contributions to the faith and the depth of his faith, the depth of his devotion to the guardian. And I'm sure many people will be inspired for many years watching this and having the, the enriching experience of, of, of learning from it. Thank you really very much. Um, let me go back now if I can figure out how. I'm gonna close the, these things and put my screen back up. Uh, here we go, share my screen, and I'll um, talk a little bit about some things that are coming up for the Wilmette Institute, because certainly people need to know about our upcoming web talks. Michael Penn, four weeks from today, will be talking about a philosophy of mind grounded in relationships of a high inspired perspective. This is his second presentation on uh, psycho a psychological topic for the Wilmette Institute's web talks. Then in July, Augusto Lopez Claros, who formerly worked for the International Monetary Fund. We'll talk about the emergence of global institutions, a really, a really very valuable insight into the, the development of, of these institutions. Uh, Susan Monick will talk about Zoroastrian cosmology in August, and Louise Prophet LeBlanc, who is a member of a First Nations tribe from the Yukon, currently living, she's currently living in Quebec, will be talking about her uh, native art and how it relates to the Baha'i writings. So we have some really very interesting web talks coming up. We also have some very interesting courses. We have this register and start the course anytime course on parental consent. Uh, people can go in and take it at their own pace, whatever they want. Uh, Monday, we have a course on Hinduism that begins, um, taught by a Baha'i with a PhD in Hinduism from Canada. Our Baha'i history course starts a week after that. And that particular course, if uh, people are particularly interested, should be available for people to take for credit if they're willing to do the additional work to do it. And of course, there's also the issue of paying the seminary. But if you're interested in that, you can contact us. And then towards the end of this month, we'll be talking about a course about uh, applying Baha'i principles uh, to discourses on the governance of the United States. If you want to know more information about the Wilmette Institute, of course, we've got our wilmetteinstitute.org web page where all of our courses and web talks are listed. And you can go to YouTube anytime to watch these presentations. So again, thank you everybody for joining us today for this uh, really precious web talk and we look forward to seeing you again in the future. Thank you.